Okay, we'll get started with our RCA presentation. Uh, we're going to go over, of course, we're still doing our, our book, uh, Bibles, a Catholic book by Jimmy Aiken, but we're going to supplement it uh, this week and maybe a little bit of next time with the, uh, the Vatican II document, De Verbum. So I made out copies for that and maybe we'll get a uh, link on the webpage to uh, the document. And it might be a little bit like watching paint dry to read it through, but I thought that's what we would do and uh, answer some of the questions on the worksheets. So we'll have the worksheets on the website as well. And then uh, we can uh, go through the document. Uh, it's just, uh, of all of the Vatican II documents, uh, this is the most, one of the most readable ones and the one of most that's applicable for everyday Catholicism. So that's why I thought we would take the time to go over it. It's just on sacred scripture, so De Verbum, the Word of God. Um, this is the dogmatic constitution. Of all of the Vatican II documents, I can only think of maybe Lumen Gentium and uh, Gaudium et Spes that might be more important for us to read. And they're a little bit lengthier documents. So this is not that long a document. We can actually, you could probably sit down and read it within an hour. It's only 26 paragraphs long. So they supplemented a lot with uh, sacred scripture and references. Uh, to the Bible, and so uh, that'll be very applicable for us. But let's uh, let's start. We'll uh, we'll say our prayer. We'll do the the Come Holy Spirit prayer. We'll start the our uh, RCA with that one, and then at the conclusion, we'll do the the poem about sacred scripture. And uh, we'll try to finish right at uh, maybe a little before 7:30, so that we can get over, and we'll finish that ninth novena mass. So we've had a uh, novena masses since. Uh, all Souls Day, November 2nd, through uh, today, uh, November 10th, uh, dedicated strictly to the souls in purgatory. And of course, we're trying to work a plenary indulgence for those uh, persons that we love as well. Okay, So we'll try to finish right up by 7.30 and then just go over to Mass and uh, receive the Eucharist. So we'll pray the Come Holy Spirit prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with we pray together. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. O God, who struck the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us by the same spirit to have right judgment in all things, ever to rejoice in his consolation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. And the Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth with joy in your heart to learn more about sacred scripture. Thanks be to God. So I, like I said, I think we can read uh, a good amount of the, the document here tonight. And there are just uh, packets on your, your chairs there. Uh, for these are the same packets that we passed out uh, last Word of God Sunday that was in February of last year. So that just a new feast in the Catholic Church that Pope Francis instituted. Uh, it might be a little bit like watching paint dry, but uh, I think there's uh, it, should, it moves along lively. And like I said before, I don't remember the uh, exact statistics on the document, but this was one of the uh, preeminent documents that the bishops made uh, back in November of uh, 1965. So... Uh, Come up on an anniversary next week here for the document, but uh, uh, there was something like I want to say 1,800 or 1,900 bishops that approved the document, and there was something like six bishops that had uh, issues with it. They would have changed not the whole thing, but just little segments of it. They would have changed. But uh, in the final vote for approval of the document, uh, it was something overwhelmingly approved by the bishops of the world at the time. So just, uh, they break it down, all the Vatican documents uh, are by paragraphs. And so you can always refer to, back to uh, uh, a reference from one of these uh, documents by, by going by the abbreviation, either uh, DV for De Verbum, and then a number. So sometimes you'll see DV number uh, 18. And that's just a reference to paragraph 18 in the De Verbum document. So instead of re... Uh, saying what the bishops or what the Holy Father wanted to say, he'll just refer to a church document by that simple shorthand. 
So anytime you see DV uh, in uh, Catholic documents, it's referring back to De Verbum. And then you could actually go back and find out what the exact quote is by going to the number. That's the paragraph you'd find it in. Okay? So uh, here with uh, paragraph one, it says, Hearing the word of God with reverence and proclaiming it with faith, this sacred synod takes its direction from these words of St. John. We announce to you the eternal life which dwelt with the Father and was made visible to us. What we have seen and heard, we announce to you, so that you may have fellowship with us, and our common fellowship be with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. So here they're talking about what St. John is saying, that uh, uh, you know, he's talking about Jesus Christ, uh, the Son that dwelt eternally with the Father, that was made visible to us, that took on our human flesh. Huh? Jesus took on that flesh of a man in the manger uh, stall in Bethlehem. And therefore, following in the footsteps of the Council of Trent and of the First Vatican Council, this present council wishes to set forth authentic doctrine on divine revelation and how it is handed on so that by hearing the message of salvation, the whole world may believe, and by believing it may hope, and by hoping it may love. Okay? So that's the, the goal of the human life is to, uh, is to fall in love with God. God is already in love with us, and uh, he has this great love for us. He wants us to fall in love with him. Uh, love has to work that way. It can't be in a marriage that just the husband loves the wife, and the wife's like, eh, I don't really care for him, but he's got a good job or something, I'll put up with him until, uh, until he dies. You know, it has to be that the wife loves the husband, and the husband loved the wife both. Well, the love doesn't work. Otherwise, it's, uh, it's called infatuation, or, or it's just a form of like. Uh, but love involves you know, two parties. And so uh, God is already in love with us. He created us in love. And he wants us to turn to him with, his, with our whole heart, give our heart back to God, to love him back. And so that's why you know, Jesus took flesh uh, to give us uh, a better understanding of how much the Father does love us. Huh? And so then, that last beautiful line there, you know, in hearing this message of salvation, what's written in sacred scripture, the whole world may believe, and by believing it may hope, and by hoping it may fall in love with God then. Huh? So it's a beautiful transition there. And we go into chapter one after the preface there, and paragraph two, and it's talking about revelation itself. So remember, when that time we're talking about divine revelation, that's uh, God revealing himself to us. That's what divine revelation means. We're going to find out how did God reveal himself to us. Well, he reveals himself to us in sacred scripture. He reveals himself to us in tradition. Most of all, the Father reveals himself to us through his Son. Okay. So those are going to be the three uh, sources, we could say, of divine revelation. But uh, Revelation itself, we'll go into that. Uh, in God's goodness and wisdom, God chose to reveal himself and make known to us the hidden purpose of his will. So that's uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 1, verse 9. Is that one of our questions? It's coming up. The word made flesh. Man might in the Holy Spirit have access to the Father and come to share in the divine nature. Let's go to, uh, if you go in your Bibles to Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verse 18. So remember, uh, anytime we're going to go to the New Testament, uh, the Gospels, one of the letters of St. Paul, uh, it's going to be at the very back of your Bible. So remember, if we uh, looked at the New Testament versus the Old, most of the Bible is going to be the Old Testament. And so this is the New Testament. See how thin it is at the back of the book. And the Old Testament, you know, three or four times thicker in the number of pages. So we're going to go to Ephesians. That's going to be right after the Gospels. So you have to go through best, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Ephesians is going to be like the fifth letter that St. Paul writes. So it's going to be Acts and then Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Uh, and then we'll get to Ephesians. Just 
marked up with. Yeah, the Galatians and then Ephesians. If you go to uh, chapter 2 in Ephesians and go to uh, verse 18 is what we're looking up. So the church fathers are going to keep referencing back to sacred scripture. You've already seen, you know, about five times that they've already referred to passages in the Bible uh, by using their abbreviation for the book and then giving us the chapter and verse. So Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 18, it says, uh, He came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, they're talking about Jesus, for through Jesus, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Right? So that's that relationship we're trying to get at, is that relationship with God the Father. And so how do we do that? Through both access of the Son and the Holy Spirit. They're going to lead, the members of the Trinity are going to lead us back to each other. Right? Being one, three persons, but one God. Uh, you can't, uh, like, uh, you can't know the one without knowing the other. They're going to introduce you to both. So that's that relationship, too, of if we go back to uh, a man and his wife in the marriage relationship. Uh, if you're the best friend of the man and the man gets married, all of a sudden the woman that he marries becomes one of your best friends as well. That's how it works, right? You don't say... Uh, you know, uh, you know, Bob, I like you, but I don't like your wife. You know, that's not possible to say that. If I like Bob, I have to like Pauline. That's that relationship. And vice versa, it works. So all of Pauline's friends, they become friends with Bob as soon as that marriage is, uh, uh, comes about through the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? So as soon as we're introduced to Jesus, he introduces us uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit back to the Father. So there's that unique relationship going on with the Trinity. Okay. Uh, through this revelation, therefore, the invisible God, so God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, pure spirit, they, we can't see them, we can't touch them. But through this revelation of the Son, the invisible God, out of the abundance of his love, speaks to men as friends and lives among them so that he may invite and take them into fellowship with himself. So we're talking about the Word of God here, but remember the Word of God is Jesus Christ. So if, remember the beginning of the Genesis story. God speaks the Word and things are created. Let there be light, there's light. Let the land separate from the sea, it happens. The Word of God that was with the Father from the beginning, that person, of, second person of the Trinity, He's the word that the Father speaks, and the Father's actions are accomplished by him speaking. And so we see there in uh, paragraph 2, you know, out of the abundance of God's love, he speaks to men as friends. So didn't Jesus, it says, lives amongst us, he lived amongst them, and so invited them to take part in fellowship with himself. So Jesus has best friends on earth. He lives with them, the apostles, and he invites them to a deeper relationship with his Father. So this plan of revelation, you know, how God is going to reveal himself, is realized by deeds and by words, having an inner unity. The deeds wrought by God in the history of salvation manifest and confirm the teachings and realities signified by the words. God isn't duplicitous. He doesn't say one thing and do another. Right? Uh, his... The action, the love of God in our world, it happens through his actions, it happens through hearing his voice. The trouble is, see, when God speaks to us, we tremble in fear. So it's, it's from the beginning, you know, uh, why does Adam hide himself in the garden when God comes? You know, the word of God, when God speaks to him, uh, he's intimidated because of the magnificence of God. Uh, Abraham in the burning bush. You know, he goes to see the bush, and as soon as he gets close, he hears the word of God, he has to fall on his face, remove the sandals from his feet. Uh, he's dealing with God. When uh, 
God is speaking to the people of Israel through Moses. Uh, there's rumbling of, on, the, on the mountain and the, the volcanoes going off. Sparks flying everywhere, lightning and thunder clashes. And uh, the people of Israel say to, uh, uh, to Moses, you know, if we have to listen to this, we're going to die of fright. You go find out what God wants to tell us and then report back. We'll believe whatever God says to you through, through Moses then, right? And so when God speaks to us the word, it, it's, you know, we tremble. And so God says, I have to have a different way of speaking to my favorite creature. I can't just speak to him directly or he'll cower in fear. And so I have to send my son as one of them Maybe they'll listen to my son, right? Isn't that what uh, God says at the baptism and again at the uh, transfiguration? This is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him, right? Listen to Jesus. Remember when God came in all that magnificence on the mountain of the transfiguration, they fell on their face, right? Peter, James, and John. And then Jesus has to go touch them and say, rise, let's, let's go about my father's will. They go down the mountain and... Uh, cure the boy that was possessed by the demon. But uh, this word of God that's contained in here, you know, it's, uh, it's frightful news to humanity. And so, you know, in the fullness of time, God winds up sending his son, the word made flesh, to reveal his love for us. Okay? Beautiful stuff, isn't this? You know, by revelation then, the deepest truth about God and the salvation of man shines out for our sake in Christ. Both who is both the mediator and the fullness of revelation. So Jesus is the mediator between God and man, and he's the fullness of the Father's revelation. Remember Jesus will say, and we'll get to this a little bit further in the document, you know, uh, St. Jude asked the question, you know, uh, Lord, why do you reveal yourself to us, the twelve, and not to the whole world? And uh, show us the Father, uh, Jesus, show us the Father, and we'll believe that you're the Son. And Jesus says, uh, that was to Philip. He says, Philip, have I been with you so long? You, do, you don't recognize the Father? When you look at me, you're looking at the Father. The Father and I are one. So that's why Jesus is the fullness of divine revelation itself. Okay? He's also that mediator between God and man, that word that goes forth to show God's love to us. And, and, that, and that's the flip side to that, too. You know, because Jesus is the mediator, we're going to use Jesus to tell God the Father how much we love him. And that's what we do in the Mass, right? So we celebrate the Mass. Why? To show our love to God. Back through the Son. So we tell Jesus, go tell your dad how much we love him. That we realize that every time we see the host raised above the altar, that we're truly looking at you, uh, Jesus, and that we believe it's you, and that you uh, gave your life for us, go tell the Father that we believe all of the love that, love that he has for us, that he sent you to die and rise from the dead for us. And so that's why we, it's so important to complete the prayers that, that the priest prays from the altar by your mass responses. So you show how much God, you, you love God by your response to the priest who's speaking in the person of Jesus for most of the mass, you show your response to God by uh, completing the words of the Lord or the words of the priest in the Mass. Then. See that? And see, that's something the world doesn't understand. And our children don't understand. They, wow, why do I need to go to Mass? Why do you go to Mass? To show the Father that you realize how much he loves you and you're trying to show him how much you love him. Right? The mediator of Jesus here, use, use him to go back and forth. Paragraph three, God who through the word, see now it's capitalized there. Anytime you see the word uh, and the word is capitalized, you can just substitute in Jesus there. So if you want to, you put God who through Jesus creates all things. Huh? Remember we said at the beginning of Genesis, let there be light. He speaks the son's name, the light happens. God who through whom the word creates all things and keeps them in existence, wow, gives men an enduring witness to himself in created realities. I think that we don't understand that. We think, you know, we just had the funeral mass of uh, Barbara Hogg today in West Brooklyn. 
you know, her earthly life has ended now, and now she's moved into a different aspect of the body of Christ, a different aspect of the church. Um, but uh, each of us was created through the word, through Jesus. God created us. And he keeps us in existence through Jesus as well. The reason that the church says that Barbara Hobb is not dead, that she's just fallen asleep in Christ. She's not dead. Jesus is going to come and wake her one day, and she's going to move into the Father's mansion for all of eternity. You can't move into somebody's house if you're dead. right? That'd be just be creepy like uh, Norman Bates or something, like keeping a dead body in the, in the room or something. You know, Barbara Hobb hasn't died because... Jesus, she was created through Jesus Christ, and her life is sustained in Jesus Christ. Because she received the body of Christ into her physical being, she ate the Eucharist every Sunday of her life, Jesus keeps her soul animate. So her soul is, still exists. Yeah, we buried her body, that's true, in the cemetery. But her body, her soul, still is in existence. It's in a place called purgatory, and it will be glorified and brought into the kingdom of heaven and given a glorified body as well one day. It still exists. Her soul is alive. And her body will come back to life as well because Jesus Christ was resurrected in the flesh. Barbara Hall will be resurrected in the flesh. See that? So Jesus keeps us. We're created through Jesus. We're kept alive through Jesus. Uh, Jesus gives men an enduring witness to himself in created realities. We can see God in all the created realities around us because God made each of these things that we can see and even those things that we can't. Okay, planning to make known the way of heavenly salvation, Jesus went further and from the start manifested himself to our first parents. And then after their fall, his promise of redemption aroused in them, Adam and Eve they're talking about, the hope of being saved. And from then on, that time on, God ceaselessly kept the human race in his care to give eternal life to those who perseveringly do good in search of salvation. Right? So God is all good. How do we acknowledge that God is all good and all loving? We do the good in our life. Right? We do the bad it's like uh, turning from God and, and going the opposite direction. Every time we do the good, it's like making sure that we're, uh, our face is pointed toward the face of God. Because remember, that's the goal ultimately of life, is to see God face to face. Right. So we ceaselessly try to do the good and we're searching for salvation. We're searching for, to see that face of God. And then at the time, God had appointed, he called Abraham in order to make him a great nation. So we could see the calling of Abraham through that burning bush. huh? And then through the patriarchs and after them, through Moses and the prophets, he taught his people to acknowledge himself, the one living and true God, provident father and just judge, and to wait for the Savior's promise by him and to wait for the Savior promised by him. And in this manner, prepare the way for the Gospels down through the centuries. See, So God is uh, directing his people, and ultimately, you know, he chooses the patriarchs, starting with Abraham, and then going to Moses and the prophets. He chooses these patriarchs uh, to bring him uh, mankind closer and closer to himself, and to bring that promise that he had at the promise of, at the end of Genesis, when uh, Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden, the promise that he would send a savior. And in this manner, it's prepared the way for the gospels to be now written down through the centuries then. So remember the gospels then, they have the pride of place of sacred scripture. Those are the books that are written, you know, about the life of the savior that came to save us, that meteor between God and man, Jesus Christ. Okay. Paragraph four. Then after speaking in many and varied ways through the prophets, now at last in these days, God has spoken to us in his Son. For he sent his Son, the eternal word, word is capitalized again, who enlightens all men, 
so that they might dwell among men and tell them of the innermost being of God. Jesus Christ, therefore, the word made flesh, was sent as a man to men. He speaks the word of God and completes the work of salvation which his father gave him to do. To see Jesus is to see the Father. So if we went to John 14, 9, I think that's uh, it's Philip that's being scolded, right? Uh, remember Philip saying, you know, let's just go there. John chapter 14, verse 9. So it's uh, the fourth book of the gospel. It's John 14, verse 9. It says, uh, yeah, Philip said to him, Master, show us the Father, that we will, and that will be enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you for so long a time, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. See that? So, uh, you know, the Schmidt boys are here. You know, uh, it'd be like, uh, you know, if I want to see uh, John Schmidt, the dad, uh, all I have to do is look to the sun. You know, a man raises his boys uh, to be a reflection of himself. Right? And the father always wants the sons to be better, his sons to be better. So Jacob, uh, his 12 sons, he wants, uh, we know who Jacob is by the 12 sons that he has. They give us a reflection of the man Jacob. And Jacob, as the father, wants each of his sons to be even better, even greater than he is. So that any of the sons of Jacob we look at, we know the characteristic of the father himself. It's the true across the board, no matter who it is, whether it's the Schmitz or the Wilsons or the McInneses, whatever it is, you know, you have a son, the father is, uh, and son are reflections of one another. Same thing same, same was with God. Okay, so that whole paragraph uh, four is talking about how, you know, this fullness of divine revelation is Jesus Christ himself. How do we know God? Yeah, through scripture, through tradition. Most definitively, we know the Father through the Son. That's the key. Jesus is the Word made flesh. Remember, we talked about that before. Every word in here, in sacred scripture, is about the Son. You know, God can't stop talking about His Son. So He wrote this big book for us to know who the Son is. And then in the New Testament, we have this revelation that the Son became flesh. And so the stories of, uh, especially the Gospels uh, of Jesus Christ, have greater impact on us because we realize how much God loves us in that person of Jesus. Okay? Chapter 5, or paragraph 5 The obedience of faith is to be given to God who reveals an obedience by which man commits his whole self freely to God, offering the full submission of intellect and will to God who reveals, and freely assenting to the truth revealed by God. To make this act of faith, the grace of God and the interior help of the Holy Spirit must precede and assist, moving the heart and turning it to God, opening the eyes of the mind and giving joy and ease to everyone in assenting to the truth and believing it, to bring about an ever deeper understanding of revelation, the same Holy Spirit constantly brings faith to completion by his gifts. Okay. It's, a, it's a really cerebral paragraph there, but we're talking about obedience of faith. That's how the paragraph starts, right? Obedience of faith. Uh, mankind knows that he's gifted. Mankind knows that he's different than a dog, than a porpoise, than a rhinoceros or a giraffe. Because mankind has intellect, he knows that he's special and that he's different, that he can contemplate himself and things that are esoteric. A dog never contemplates himself. He only sees and contemplates, he only contemplates what he can see and hear, and taste, and touch. So that's why your dog, his tail starts wagging every time you come into the room. 
because he sees you, and so he gets excited about that. You don't get excited about himself. A dog, you know, you show a dog himself in the mirror, the dog doesn't know what it is. The dog's never seen himself before. I imagine a dog thinks he looks like a human person because that's who he hangs around with all the time. So it's that old thing. You know, if, if somebody has uh, two men are working in a coal mine and they come up out of the coal mine after working eight hours down there and the one coal miner looks at his uh, friend in the light of day and he sees that his friend has a dirty face from all the coal suit that he's been working with. And the other man, the man that looked over there, that has a, uh, uh, maybe his face is clean. He didn't get any soot. He wasn't working that hard that day. But because the man with no soot on his face looks over and he sees the man with dirt on his face, he goes home and washes his face anyway because he saw that his buddy had dirt on his face. But the buddy that had dirt on his face looked at his friend and sees the friend, no dirt at all, no soot at all on his face. He doesn't go home and wash. He just goes to the pub and has a drink, not knowing his face is still dirty. Because he looked at his friend and his friend's face wasn't dirty. He assumed he wasn't dirty. See that? That's like how it is with a dog. They don't know. They don't contemplate themselves. That's why your dog wants to sleep on your bed. He don't know he's a dog that he's supposed to be sleeping on the floor. He thinks he's a human. Humans sleep in a bed, I gotta sleep in the bed, right? You gotta tell him, no, no, you're a dog, sleep on the floor. And if you don't tell him that, he jumps in the bed with you, right? How are we getting onto this? Uh, it's back to this obedience of faith, right? The man has intellect. And so we think that we're smart, that we're different. And obedience of faith means that when God reveals himself to us, uh, we have to accept that. See, in offering the full submission of his intellect and will to God who revealed himself. Because God is superior to us, we have to realize that when we read his sacred word, that it's the ultimate truth in the universe and that we ought to believe it and to live it as best we can. We can't think that if God is this divine person, that he says something, but uh, that doesn't apply to me. I don't have to live that. You have to have submission of your intellect and will to God because of his superiority to you. And that's the trouble that the world has. There are some human beings out there, I would say the majority of human beings out there, who won't submit to the will of God, but they'll do their will instead because they think that they're greater than God himself. That's the big part of people not living their Catholic faith. Because if they live their Catholic faith, what they're saying is that this is what's best for me. God told me what's best for me, and so I'm doing it. They think they have this submission of will that happens when that happens. They don't want to submit their will and their intellect to God's way of thinking. And so if I just stay away from church, if I don't read sacred scripture, if I don't receive the sacraments, then I'm, I can do what I want to do. I have the superior intellect of how I look at the world and how I act in the world. But if we have this belief that God is our creator, that he's far superior to us uh, than we are to ourselves, then we have to have this full submission of our intellect and will to God who reveals himself to us. And in order to make this act of faith, we need the grace of God itself. And the interior help of the Holy Spirit must proceed and assist us. Otherwise, we never turn our heart and our mind over to God. So we have to have grace. We have to have the assistance of the Holy Spirit in order to have this total obedience of faith and to believe that what God has set forth for us is the best plan for our life. Otherwise, I think the best plan for my life is what I have to decide for myself. But once, it says there, at, in chapter, at the end of paragraph 5, once our eyes are opened and our mind gives assent to this obedience of faith, all of a sudden there's this joy and this ease in living our life 
and assenting to the truth and believing it. Once you believe in what the Catholic Church is putting forth for your goodness, you don't have any trouble in keeping the commandments, in trying to live the Beatitudes. But until you have that obedience of faith, your life is in a constant struggle and in a dynamic against God. Remember St. Paul, you know, uh, Jesus says to Satan, St. Paul, why do you chafe, what do you, what does he say, chafe against the bit or something like that? What's that, what's that word in scripture? Chase, uh, chafe against the goad. I think that's how it is in sacred scripture. St. Paul, why are you trying to act counter to the way I, Jesus Christ, want you to act uh, for your own salvation? Don't kick against the goad. I think that's what it is in scripture. Okay. Let's go on to paragraph six there. But if really, if we understand paragraph five, that's the paragraph you give uh, to the intellectual, to the atheist, uh, to the person that says, ah, uh, yeah, there is a God, but uh, I know there's a better way to live my life than the way he's telling me to do it through sacred scripture or through the church. That's paragraph five of De Verbum is what you show them, huh? Okay. Paragraph six, through divine revelation, God chose to show forth and to communicate himself and the eternal decision of his will regarding the salvation of man. That is to say, he chose to share with them these divine treasures which totally transcend the understanding of the human mind. Divine treasures, sacred scripture, treasure, sacred tradition, a treasure. Jesus Christ, the pearl of great price, right? Where, will we be willing to sell all of our possessions in order to buy the field where the pearl of great price is hidden. That's what God watches for, right? That's Jesus. As a sacred synod, so here's the bishops talking outside of themselves now. As a sacred synod, we have affirmed God, the beginning and the end of all things, can be known with certainty from created realities by the light of human reason. So we can know about God through our, our human reason and our intellect. Uh, teaches that it is through his revelation that those religious truths which are by their nature accessible to human reason can be known by all men with ease, with solid certitude and with no trace of error, even in the present state of the human race. So how do I know the truth exists? You know, Pontius Pilate, what is truth? The truth was staring him in the face. He was looking at the Son of God. He was seeing God the Father by looking at Jesus. Jesus is the truth. And we can know that with certainty and that we won't be in error. Even in the midst of all of the difficulties and the pandemic that we're in now, we have this focus on Jesus Christ. We know that everything's going to be all right because the Father loves us and we're trying to love the Father with our whole heart, mind, soul, That was uh, chapter one for Dave Erwin. How are we doing? Well, we only did six paragraphs. We'll never get through this thing. Huh? I'm talking too much about the different paragraphs. But uh, you see, it's uh, you know, the bishops. This is such a. The other documents of Vatican II, they don't read quite like this. That's why you're going to find most of your Bibles are going to have Dave Verbum in them. Yet, because it does talk about sacred scripture. So it's the, uh, the sacred constitution on, on, the, on, on the word of God. But um, it's very accessible uh, to the people. And so the bishops really are speaking from their heart to us in this, in this document. Okay, chapter 7, it's this handing on of divine revelation. Remember, what's divine revelation? How does God reveal himself to mankind? In his gracious goodness, God has sent to it has seen to it that what he had revealed for the salvation of all the nations would abide permanently in its full integrity and be handed on to those generations. Therefore, Christ the Lord, in whom the full revelation of the supreme God is complete, commissioned the apostles to preach to all men that gospel which is the source of all saving truth and moral teaching, and to impart to them heavenly gifts. <coughs> So we see now the apostles are stepping into the picture. So the Christ taught the apostles, and he revealed 
uh, the Father through himself. He taught those apostles to know God. And now the apostles are to preach to all men this source of saving truth that they learned. Uh, the moral teachings and to impart the heavenly gifts to us. So, and to impart to them heavenly gifts. What are heavenly gifts? They're the sacraments, right? So the apostles are going to be the first priests. They're going to give to us not just teachings on how to live a moral, upstanding life, but they're going to give us gifts from heaven. Grace of God, baptism, confession, the Eucharist, confirmation, holy matrimony, anointing the sick, holy orders. This gospel had been promised in former times through the prophets. So the prophets keep telling, saying, the Son of God is coming, the Messiah is coming. And Christ himself had fulfilled it, and he promulgated it with his lips. Right? That's why we stand for the gospel. So the readings of St. Paul, the letters of St. John, uh, we just sit down in the Mass. But then we hear the gospel acclamation, we stand up because Jesus is coming to proclaim the word of God with his own lips. Huh? This commission, we're talking about the Synod, was faithfully fulfilled by all the apostles who by their oral preaching, by example, and by observances, handed on what they had received from the lips of Christ, from living with him, from what he did, or what they had learned through the prompting of the Holy Spirit. So how are the apostles going to hand on to us this divine revelation? They're going to do it by their oral preaching. They're going to be doing it by example. So if you read uh, the first reading that we have for Mass tonight, same as we had for the morning Mass, <coughs> I'll change the Gospel for this uh, Novena Mass for All Souls, but that uh, first reading is a letter of St. Paul to Titus. And Paul's telling Titus, teach the people by your example. Yeah, you can do it by preaching, the oral preaching, but people are going to look at you, at your life, how you live your life, your example of yourself, as to whether they believe in the teachings that you're proclaiming. So St. Uh, Titus is supposed to tell older men how to live, then he tells older women how to live, then he tells young men how to live, then he tells uh, young women and children how to live. Okay. And so it's interesting, we did that mass for, that reading for uh, Barbara Hobbs' funeral this morning too because it talked about what is the demeanor of an older woman supposed to be? An older woman is supposed to teach the younger women how to love their husband and their children. Isn't that interesting in that reading there? You would think that uh, we shouldn't be have to be taught how to love our spouse or how to love our children. But St. Paul told Titus, you have to teach the people how to love the person they're married to. What happens when one generation doesn't teach the next generation how to love? Divorce happens. So that's why divorce rate is so high in our country, highest it's ever been, because the last generation didn't teach their children how to love your spouse. And St. Paul says, you're supposed to teach the next generation how to love children. You would think, that's got to be the most simplistic thing. It's almost impossible not to love a child, right? Why do we have to be taught to love children? It seems uh, silly to even say that. But uh, isn't uh, the abortion rate as high as it's ever been today? There are people that hate children. That's why so many babies are killed. We have to be taught how to love. Even our own spouse, even our own children. And if we're not taught how to love them, we don't love them. That's why Jesus came, to teach us how to love his Father. Because for the 3,000 years before Christ, mankind didn't learn how to love God. And so the Son becomes flesh to teach us how to love God. Where are we at here?
Okay. So, you know, in his graciousness, God has sent, seen to it that he's revealed for the salvation of all the nations this full integrity to be handed down from generation to generation that we're supposed to uh, proclaim uh, the word of God, these apostles, by their preaching, by their example, by the observances handed on to them that they receive from the Christ himself and from the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Uh, let's go to paragraph 8. And so the apostolic preaching, which is expressed in a special way in the inspired books, was to be preserved by an unending succession of preachers until the end of time. So it's not just the 12 that have this special uh, way to uh, pass on uh, the duties of sacred scripture, uh, but there's supposed to be an unending succession of preachers until the second coming of the Christ. And therefore, the apostles, handing on what they themselves had received, warned the faithful to hold fast to the traditions which they have learned either by word or by mouth or by letter, and to fight in defense of the faith handed on once and for all. See that? So we're given this warning that we're supposed to hold fast to these traditions that are written down in sacred scripture, that are passed on by oral preaching, or that were given in letters, and to fight in defense of the faith. Now what was handed on by the apostles includes everything which contributes toward the holiness of life and increase in faith of the peoples of God. And so the church, in her teaching, life and worship, penetrates and hands on to all generations all that she herself is and all that she believes. So there's not something extra that the apostles weren't given that can be learned, that the church wasn't given, that can be learned outside of the church. The church is given, just as the apostles were given, this fullness of faith. And so we can have this faith that uh, the peoples of God will be taught uh, how to live, how to worship, how to let uh, the work of our hands propagate to each generation so that we can believe everything that God has told us. God hasn't squirreled away some information that's necessary for our salvation. It's all either here in sacred scripture, it's in the actions of the church, it's in the traditions of the church. So we're starting to build towards the end of uh, this chapter. It's going to have the uh, three uh, legs of the, of the stool. So if we think of a stool with three legs on it uh, that holds up divine revelation, the three legs are going to be sacred scripture, the Bible, sacred tradition, and the magisterium. Without those three legs on that stool, the stool can't, can't stand up. It can't, it's too wobbly. So here's what they're doing in this uh, sequentially, paragraph by paragraph. We're building towards those three elements of divine revelation. Uh, this tradition, which comes from the apostles, developed in the church with the help of the Holy Spirit, for there is a growth in the understanding of the realities and the words which have been handed down. This happens through the contemplation and study made by believers who treasure these things in their heart. That's just like Mary, huh? Through a penetrating and understanding of these spiritual realities which they experience, and through the preaching of those who have received through Episcopal succession the sure gift of faith. For as the centuries succeed one another, the church constantly moves forward toward the fullness of divine truth until the words of God reach their complete fulfillment in her. The words of the Holy Father is witness to the presence of this living tradition, which is wealth poured into the practice of life. So, you know, they're establishing the tradition here of the church. So, yeah, there's this printed word uh, that we have in the word of God in, in, in word form in our Bible, but also how the church is living on this uh, has this living tradition that she practices with her life. And here there exists a close connection and communication between sacred scripture and sacred, and sacred tradition. Okay. So here now, we're going to find out what the uh, relationship is between tradition and scripture. So that's always the big battle. The Protestants saying there's only sacred scripture. 
and the church say, no, no, there's scripture and tradition. It says in paragraph 9, so this is important for the definition of both of these. For both of them, both tradition and scripture, flow from the same divine wellspring. So they're coming both from God, and in a certain way they merge into a unity and tend toward the same end. For sacred scripture is the word of God, inasmuch as it is consigned to writing under the inspiration of the divine spirit, while sacred tradition takes the word of God, entrusted by the Christ, the Lord, and the Holy Spirit to the apostles, and hands it on to their successors in its full purity. Okay? So here's the definition of scripture. Scripture is divine revelation, the word of God written down. And it's no different than how God reveals himself to the apostles through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Uh, tradition is that which is not written down, but still gives us an image of what God looks like in all his purity and all his light. So as they talk about there being a wellspring, so if you pictured a well, an old well, and the water wells up out of the well, and it forms two streams. So part of the water, picture a well at the top of a hill, and down one side of the hill runs one stream of water, and down the other side of the hill runs another stream of water. So one is sacred scripture, one is tradition. They both run down the hill, and in the valley of the hill, they come back together. And instead of flowing from that well that they came from, they pool into another reservoir called Jesus Christ. And so what does the Father do? He pours out all of his love to the Son through those two streams. And then what does the Son do? He pours out all of his love back to the Father through those two streams. The word that he preached and the actions of the Christ, they reveal the love that the Father gave to him. So that's that image. Sacred scripture and tradition, they're not two different things. They're both the love of God manifesting themselves in different forms. They just flow down the mountain in a, on a different side. But they come together in the Christ, and then the Christ sends them back out and reflects back the glory of God. So that's an interesting thing there. There's say that, uh, and again, it's, we always use this marriage analogy because there's two in marriage. You know, uh, the love that's in a marriage, it's manifested in the person of the husband and it's manifested in the person of the wife. And if you take one of those persons out, it's not, it's not love anymore. It's not a marriage. You need both of those persons in order for the love uh, to, be, to flow between them and to be generated pool into a source. So scripture and tradition, they're divine revelation. They're both revealing the love that God has for the human race then. Let's, uh, let's try to wrap this up. So we're, uh, we'll go to the last paragraph and that's how we'll start with next time. Uh, the last uh, paragraph in uh, paragraph 10 there, the last section, says, It is clear, therefore, that sacred tradition and sacred scripture and the teaching of the authority of the church, that's the magisterium, in accord with God's most wise design, are so linked and joined together that one cannot stand without the other. Remember, we're talking about those three legs on a, a stool. One leg is tradition, one leg is scripture, one leg is the magisterium, the teaching authority of the church. Uh, joined together so that they can, one, one cannot stand without the others, and that all together, and each in its own way, under the action of the one Holy Spirit, contribute effectively to the salvation of souls. So we need all three of those things coming together if we're going to know salvation, if we're going to enter back into the glory of the Father's kingdom through the love that the Son uh, gives to us to give back to God, God the Father. So just keep that image in mind of uh, the threeness of scripture, tradition, and the magisterium. And then part chapter three and part two of De Verbum are just going to talk about that interaction, mostly between scripture and tradition, 
but they're going to feed in there, you know, how ma the magisterium and the teachings of the church come out as well. Okay? So for next time, uh, we'll meet the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, and uh, we'll just hit the chapter 3, and we'll finish that section 2 on the, on the worksheet. And uh, if you didn't get to write the answers down to section uh, 1's worksheet, uh, we'll have those next time as the review, okay? Um, did anybody have any questions or anything that came out in our reading just now of uh, this first two uh, chapters of Dave Verbum that they had a question on? You, you could think of the three-legged stool as like the thing in the middle of the pizza, in the uh -huh. middle of the pizza box. It has three legs, uh -huh. and without it, the pizza would be squashed. Yeah, yeah, good. So it, it's like protecting yeah, that's a good answer. See, uh, so Aaron's coming up with the uh, image of that image, that little pl plastic piece that keeps the the cardboard uh, box off of your pizza from ruining the toppings. You know, you that that three pronged uh, plastic piece that uh, keeps the integrity of your pizza that so it doesn't taste like cardboard. Huh? Yeah, so that's like tradition and scripture and the magisterium. Good. Yeah, so it's just a very readable document, and I think like. You know, we drew it out, but, you know, it's very easy to read, uh, you know, a 26-paragraph document, and it doesn't get, it's most as esoteric as it gets was that chapter 5, or paragraph 5, uh, when it's talking about that obedience of faith. That's about as deep as uh, Dave Erebum's going to get as far as an esoteric topic. Okay. Let's uh, pray our prayer to the, uh, the Holy Spirit for sacred scripture, and then we'll conclude for the night. We'll have our... Final Mass and our Novena of Masses. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Lord be with you. We pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, be present now, and let your Holy Spirit bow. All hearts and love and truth today, to hear your word and keep your way. Give us the grace to grasp your word, that we may do what we have heard. Instruct us through the scriptures, Lord, as we draw near. God adore. May your glad tidings always bring good news to men that they may sing of how you came to save all men, instruct us till you come again. To God the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit, three in one, to you, O blessed Trinity, be praised throughout eternity. And the Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go in the peace of Christ to love and serve our Lord. Thank you, God.